All right, welcome everybody. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the cell and we're going to talk about a concept called uh, depolarization and repolarization. So this is kind of an important concept because essentially a lot of things that we do uh, when we give drugs, for example, or a lot of disease processes specifically relate to the cell's ability to repolarize or to depolarize. And in fact, sometimes when the cells don't do so, when they're unable to depolarize and repolarize correctly, we'll actually be able to see that on certain devices. For example, the EKG might be a great tool uh, for us to consider when we're talking about depolarization and repolarization anomalies that we can actually physically see uh, on, a, on a graphical representation with the EKG. So let's talk about these in uh, uh, just very brief detail here. This is kind of the just the depth that you need to know. All right, so first of all, what is uh, polarity? So let's take a look here. Let's just draw ourselves a cell. And this is going to be a cardiac cell, but it can be any cell, nervous system, you name it. Um, so this is going to be the inside of our cell. This, of course, will be the surrounding or outside of our cell. And if we were to look at the important components, the constituents that lie outside of the cell that are going to be uh, important for us to consider right now, the first thing we're going to talk about is the fact that sodium is the most prevalent extracellular cation. So uh, prevalence means how much of it exists. Sodium, that's this guy here, natrium or sodium. And it's a positively charged ion, so it's a cation, important for you to consider. So all around the cell, all around all of our cells, these cells are being bathed in a solution which, is, uh, which has a high concentration of sodium as compared to the inside of that cell. All right, so now inside the cell we have a couple things as well, and inside the cell we have potassium. So potassium is the most prevalent intracellular cation. All right, so outside the cell there's potassium too, but compared to the inside, inside has a greater concentration of potassium, much greater concentration of potassium than outside of the cell. All right, and there are a bunch of other things that also exist inside the cell. And I'll just label them here as ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's the unit of energy that the cell uses to do work. And there are, of course, proteins inside the cell. And there's also chloride inside the cell. And these three guys here are very electronegative. They're negative in nature. If you were to measure their, their voltage, if you will, um, they're negative. So when you take a volt probe, or if you were to take a volt probe and you were to put one of the probe ends outside the cell. All right, here's a little volt probe guy. And this is our area here. Here's zero. This is negative. This is positive. And this is our little needle hub that's here. If you were to take one of your testing poles and you were to just stick it in the solution outside the cell, and next you take another probe and you stick it inside the cell, the voltage that exists across this membrane, the cell membrane, would be negative. All right, so the inside of the cell is negative compared to the outside of the cell. In fact, it's negative to the tune of about negative 70. I'm also going to write negative 90 millivolts because it depends on what tissue you're looking at. That way, if you're reading something and you come across it, any of these are acceptable. It just depends on which piece of muscle or which nerve you're looking at. So somewhere between negative 70 and negative 90 millivolts is how electronegative the inside of that cell is compared to the surrounding area. So this is pretty cool because we have this membrane, we have this established barrier that forms the cell itself, and inside we have proteins and ATP and chloride and potassium in high concentration compared to the outside where we have a ton of sodium, and if we were to measure the amount of potential energy that exists across this cell membrane, the answer would be approximately negative 70 millivolts. So this is a really important concept because this concept tells us about a polarized, polarized cell. So when we talk about polarity, we're talking about something that definitely has a north and a south pole. We're talking about something that's either black or white. We're talking about something that's positive or negative. Um, so when we talk about polarity, we're talking about energy potentials. We're talking about a level of stored energy that exists across a cell membrane uh, 
based on the concentration of ions and some other, uh, some other molecules that reside within the cell that essentially allow us to do work. So now as our cells just rest and nothing's going on at rest, our cells are in a polarized state. That is that there is a negative interior compared to the outside, which is predominantly more positive. So this is kind of a cool concept. All right, so now let's take a look at what happens in the next phase here. So let's open a new page and let's take a quick peek at what's going to happen to our cell here. So here is this polarized cell. And this polarized cell, as we said, had a bunch of potassiums in it because it is the most prevalent intracellular cation. And we also said that outside the cell, we had a ton of sodium that exists here. All right, so let's take a look at what happens next. So the next piece we're going to introduce here is we're going to say that there's an event that triggers. So I'm just going to draw a little thing here, and I'm going to say this is a triggering event. So there's a trigger. And the trigger is going to open channels that exist inside this cell membrane and allow these ions to leak out. So let's take a look at the first thing that happens. So I'm actually going to erase a little bit of this, this cell membrane here. We'll do it in a couple little spots. And we're going to see exactly what kind of channels open and what happens to the cell as a result of those channels opening. So the first thing we're going to look at is the very first step that happens. And the very first step that happens is we have these little guys that lie right inside this cell membrane. And these little guys are going to be sodium channels. And as you can suspect, sodium channels are little protein channels that exists in the cell membrane and their only function is to allow or disallow movement of sodium. So when this triggering event happens, the first thing that happens as a result of that trigger is that sodium channels open. So sodium channels open. And as you can see just by this very simplistic graph is that the sodium concentration is greater outside the cell than it is inside the cell and as a result we have a concentration gradient. So if you were to look at inside the cell and outside the cell, if you look at the concentration gradient it would look something like this where we would have a highest concentration gradient outside the cell and inside the cell lowest concentration gradient for sodium and as a result ions always move down their concentration gradient, meaning from highest area to lowest area. So when we open these sodium channels, these guys are going to come in here and they're going to leak into the cell. So the sodium channels that have opened as a result of this trigger over here allow sodium to rush inside the cell because of the fact that there's a concentration gradient that exists and sodium travels down its concentration gradient. Now at the same time or just shortly thereafter we're going to look at a different phenomenon that takes place and this next phenomenon is going to look at potassium movement. So if we take a look at these crude uh, drawings of what I'm going to say are potassium channels, um, at some point this event that triggered sodium channels from opening is then going to open these potassium channels and as you can see if we do the same thing here if we look at potassium, you're going to see that the concentration gradient inside the cell to outside the cell is going to travel in this direction because we've got a ton of potassium inside and almost no potassium outside, so travel is going to be towards the outward direction. So same concept here. Potassium is going to go. It's going to travel right down to the uh, potassium channels, and it's going to leak out. So now if we go back to the original concept here, and the original concept was what would our voltmeter tell us if we measured the voltage inside the cell versus outside the cell? And we said this was zero, and we said this was positive, this is negative. Now if we were to take this same volt probe and we were to put one of our probes inside the cell and leave one of the probes measuring outside the cell, meaning that we're measuring the potential energy or the potential voltage that exists across this cell membrane, now we would end up with essentially a zero reading.
And the zero reading is because things are going to equalize. Remember that when we have concentration channels, uh, when we have concentration gradients and open channels, things are going to try to equalize. So if we had four uh, sodiums outside to begin with and none inside after the sodium channels open, ideally we will end up with two and two. Same thing with potassium. If we've started with four and zero in the opposite direction, four in, zero out, then after the channels open, we'd end up with two and two. And so if we end up with two positives and two positives and two positives and two positives, meaning four in and four out, then we're going to essentially have a zero condition. Things will equalize here. As a result, we'll end up with a zero on our voltmeter. So this is a really important concept because this concept is called depolarization. So depolarization occurs when channels that are embedded inside the plasma membrane, the cell membrane, open and allow an equilibrium to take place between the ions that exist outside the cell and the ions that exist inside the cell. When they're allowed to equilibrate, we end up with a zero on the voltmeter and that is called depolarized, meaning that it's zero. There is no polarity anymore. It's not polarized. It's resting right at zero, meaning things are equal. So this is kind of a cool concept. So we started with, in the previous, we started with a cell that was polarized, and we, said, we explained why it was polarized. Now we have an event that triggers depolarization, which means we open these channels up, and boom, we end up at zero when we measure the voltage. So let's take a look at what happens next. So now we have a depolarized cell from the previous trace. So this depolarized cell is just hanging out here and we have some sodium out here. We have some sodium in here. All right. And we also have some potassium that's in both of those places. Sorry, I changed colors on you there. So we have potassium out here. We have potassium in here. All right, so if you look at this setup here, this is a depolarized cell. If you look at this setup, we have a problem here because sodium will never automatically go back out of the cell because it's equal in terms of its concentration. And things don't move against their concentration gradients on their own. Similarly, potassium is equal in this setup and potassium is not also going to move against its concentration gradient on its own. So we have something else that exists. So let's talk a little bit about how we restore where we, need to, uh, where we need to go with this. And restoration of the resting membrane potential is done through the sodium potassium ATPase. That's an enzyme that catalyzes ATP. This is a pump system. Sodium potassium ATPase pump. So this pump is literally going to reach out and connect with the potassiums that lie outside and it is going to force them to come in here. So now we're going to take that potassium that was outside and it's going to go away from the outside and it is going to be brought back into the intracellular compartment. So this sodium potassium pump is very cool because it has the ability to selectively pick out out of here, it's going to pick out the potassiums and dump them in. Similarly, the sodium potassium pump is then going to take these sodiums and it's going to blow them out of the cell um, back into the extracellular space. And it's going to do so with the use of ATP. So in order for you to reestablish a concentration gradient, in order for you to move ions against the direction that they want to be in, you have to include something and that's called energy. So this whole process is going to use a lot of ATP. Right? ATP is going to be used to reestablish the resting membrane pot potential. So essentially what we've done here is we've taken this concept of a resting uh, of a depolarized cell and we've repolarized that cell by simply activating the sodium potassium pump and by forcing all the sodium that was inside the cell back out where it belongs, by taking all the potassium that was outside the cell and forcing it back in, and we did that by way of using energy, and that's called ATP, and the sodium-potassium pump to accomplish what we want to do.
So in our final state here, this is a cell that is said to be repolarized. So I won't draw the voltmeter again, but if you were to measure the, the membrane potential, the amount of potential energy that exists across this membrane, you would see that it again has returned to a negative 70 millivolt resting state. And in that case, we, said that we say that it has repolarized or that it is polarized as a result of this movement of ions. So all pretty cool concepts. All right, so now I want to just do this for you. I want to say, let's draw this graphically so that we can see what this looks like a little bit more simplistically. And here's the best graph that we can draw, and you've probably seen this. Whoops, let's, uh, let's do that over here a little bit. Sorry, my hand is, uh, is not so steady. All right, so let's take a look at this. Let's see if we can get that better. So here we're going to have a graph which is supposed to be representative of a resting membrane potential and all of the phases that we just talked about through depolarization. So I'm going to label this graph and the x-axis is going to be time and it's going to be in milliseconds. So these things happen in thousandths of a second. And on the y-axis, we're going to label this in millivolts where this dotted line is about negative 70 millivolts. We're going to draw a different dotted line up here. Let's see if we can line it up here. This is going to be zero millivolts. And we'll draw a third line up here, and this will be about positive 20 millivolts. So let's take a look at what happens here. Well, first, let's, uh, let's make things a little easier on us. Let's label these as phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, and these phases are referring to the depolarization and repolarization phases. So in phase zero, the very first thing that happens is we get this trigger, that's down here, and that trigger causes phase zero to take place, and phase zero is when sodium channels open. So we talked a little bit about that, and we said, in fact, when we have a trigger that takes place, the sodium channels open, and when they open, they allow us to have rapid influx of sodium into the cell. All right, in phase one, this is now where repolarization takes place. So phase zero is depolarization, phase one is repolarization. During repolarization, here we have potassium channels that open, so we have potassium moving out. In phase two, we have calcium channels that are moving intracellularly, so calcium goes back into the cell. During phase three, again, we're moving potassium again, and I put zero here and shouldn't have. This should actually be phase four, and phase four is our resting phase. So this is a graphic representation of the last couple slides, and this presentation, this graph, shows us that when we open sodium channels, we go from negative 70 millivolts all the way up to just a little bit over zero. And the reason for that is because there's a little bit of overspill. So when you open those sodium channels, there's a huge, massive rush of sodium inside the cell and a little bit more sodium that is required to go into the cell to equalize goes into the cell. So it causes a little bit of a positive um, value inside the cell very, very transiently. And as soon as this happens, this allows this cascade of repolarization to take place. So sodium opens, it causes the depolarizing effect on the cell, and then immediately we have repolarization. So that sodium potassium ATPase pump is activated at this point, and we start we start putting sodium and potassium back where they belong, and we start to regenerate ATP and those proteins and put chloride back into the cell, and as a result, we get a decrease in voltage. So look what happens. It goes from negative 70. You open the positive channel gates. Sodium rushes in, makes the cell less negative, meaning more positive, which you see. It goes straight up. Then once it reaches that, there's this little plateau that takes place. Things are electrically neutral. So the amount of negatives versus the amount of positives is about equal to zero. They're equal to one another. As we start to regenerate ATP, then we start to have a negativity that, it, that reestablishes itself, and then we rest. So this is a graphic representation. It's called the, act, uh, the uh, resting membrane, I'm sorry, the action potential slide.
And this diagram is just designed to illustrate the movement or the change in voltage inside the cell throughout the different phases that exist here. So this is going to be really important for us in a little while because we're actually going to put an EKG tracing on this. So we'll put a QRS and T wave on this in a little while and we'll associate each portion of the EKG with movement of certain ions. And those movements are going to be really, really important for us as we view them on the EKG in a little bit. So there's something else, one last thing we have to talk about on these and why they're, why they're important, and that is the concept of refractoriness. And refractoriness refers to a condition where no matter how strong the trigger exists, so here we have a trigger, no matter how strong this trigger is, if a cell is refractory to that trigger, that means that it can't respond to that trigger. So let's take a look at this for a second. So in fact, when we're looking at all these movements of ions, and when we're looking at a cell that is polarized, when a cell is polarized, it can absolutely respond to a trigger. And in fact, right at this moment here during phase four, the cell is polarized. During that triggering event, as soon as the sodium channels open, this rapid influx of sodium takes place and we have depolarization of that cell. So as soon as it peaks at this point here, the cell has depolarized. So this rapid influx of sodium has depolarized. And as a result, from this point forward, the cell is said to be in a state of refractoriness, meaning that even if another trigger makes it to this cell, it can't possibly cause the sodium channels to open and depolarization to take place because the cell has already done that and it hasn't reset yet. So refractoriness is a period of time that goes by where the cell is simply unable to respond to another stimulus, another trigger. And the purpose of that, is particular, particularly in the cardiac cells, is multifold. One of the things that it allows to do, it, is, it allows the timing to be just right to allow the atria or the ventricles to completely fill with blood before they try to squeeze again. So that's one of the conditions. The other thing is we want to have some regulatory control over how fast the overall heart rate is. And we can, we can again do that by changing the refractoriness of these cells. So this is a really important and a really, really cool concept. So as soon as you have depolarization that takes place um, after phase one is over, then we immediately go into the repolarization of the cell. And during repolarization of the cell, there is a level of refractoriness that exists, meaning a level of inability to respond to an additional stimulus. And refractoriness can be broken down into two categories. One of them is called absolute refractoriness, and the other one is called relative refractoriness. So you'll see it as the relative refractory period and the relative refractory period. All right? And this just speaks to the amount of time and the amount of refractoriness that the cell is undergoing. So for now, what you need to remember is that up until about the midway point of phase three, so on the down slope here, if you were to measure this elevation, if that elevation happened to be 10 up and down here, 10 whatever, let's just leave it at 10 without a unit, then wherever five is right in the middle, this period of time from the end of phase zero all the way to this point where we end up at this intersection right here, this is called the absolute refractory period of the cell. So the cell's absolute refractory period is defined by the end of phase zero and the midway point of phase three. During that period, no matter how many stimuli or how many triggers reach the cell, no matter how strong that trigger or stimulus is that reaches the cell, under no circumstance, absolutely positively not, the cell cannot respond to these triggers or these stimuli meaning that it can't depolarize or it can't cause muscle contraction or it can't carry on or convey a message. Now, between this five, so at the midway point of phase three all the way to the end of phase three, that cell is said to be in a relative state of refractoriness where 
if a trigger or if a stimulus is is able to make it to the cell, if it actually gets to the cell, and if it's strong enough, then the cell is able to respond and to then again depolarize. So absolute refractoriness, it absolutely can't respond. Relative refractoriness, it's possible to respond. So let me give you something that you can take home and actually work with here. So I'm going to I'm going to connect and parallel the action potential of a heart cell, for example, to a toilet. So I'm going to say that your heart cells function the same way as a toilet does. And here's how. The next time you go home or you're in your house, I want you to go to the bathroom. Once you're done going to the bathroom, I want you to flush your toilet. And I want you to wait exactly one second, not anything more, not anything less, and I want you to try to flush again. And what's going to happen to your toilet? And the answer is, well, absolutely nothing. You won't get another flush again. And I'm going to say to you, why wouldn't the toilet be able to flush again? Correct answer, because the toilet is in a state of absolute refractoriness. So I would say, explain that to me a little bit more. And you tell me, well, the tank has exhausted its supply of water when I flushed it. So consider phase zero as the event that depolarizes your toilet. You push on the handle. The water comes out. It goes into the toilet bowl and it goes away down the down to the sewer. And at that very moment, your toilet is depolarized. And it is unable, no matter how many times you hit that, that flush button again or the handle, it absolutely positively cannot go again. So you're going to wait a little period of time. Let's say you wait now 15 or 20 seconds. And that is going to equate to the midway point of repolarization of phase three. Now, if you flush again during the after the midpoint of phase three to the beginning of phase four, meaning when it's completely filled, if you were to flush again, what would you get? You'd get a partial flush, meaning that a little bit of water that has accumulated in the tank will now actually cause a flush to take place. But it won't be a full flush. It'll just be a partial flush. In that case, and during that time period, I would say that your toilet is in a state of relative refractoriness so if you were to push that trigger again during this time frame here, then you would get a partial flush again. And then, of course, if you flush and you allow it to go all the way till it reaches phase four and you don't hear water running anymore, then at that point, if you were to flush again, well, we're back here and we would start at the whole thing. Toilet's polarized. It receives a trigger. You pull on the handle. It depolarizes. It plateaus and it waits, waits, waits for all the whatever's in your toilet to go down. And then it starts to repolarize again. And once it reaches that point, then you can get a partial flush. Until then, you get nothing. All right, so I hope you've learned a little bit about uh, polarity, depolarization, the process of depolarization and the movement of the ions, and the process of repolarization and the movement of those ions, and that you've understood a little bit better by using a graphic representation of ion movement, specifically by looking at the voltage, how this process works, and last but not least, we talked about the refractoriness of a cell and how we use that to our benefit when we're trying to maximize fill time of the ventricles and of the atrial chambers. All right, so stay tuned. We'll do a lot more about this stuff, but this will give you a good intro.